Hi, I'm Rick Dior, and today we're going to talk about foot technique. Let's get started with the equipment that I use, so you know um, what I use and how I use it. So this has been the pedal that I've used for the past maybe 25 years. This is a Tama Iron Cobra. I have no affiliation with Tama. I just love this pedal. It's really quiet. I like the one with the strap. If that's still made, I'm not sure it is. I prefer this over the chain. To me, the chain's a little bit noisy over time. It will also break. I've never had one of these straps break. So to me, this is a great um, combination of sturdiness, uh, you know, longevity in the pedal, obviously, is that, that's what you want, and quietness and smoothness of action. Now, as far as beaters go, I use several beaters with my um, bass drum pedal. So I use a wood one that Vic Firth makes. I use a double-sided beater that DW makes. Uh, you don't have to use this counterweight. I do, usually. And it has a felt end and a hard end here. And then I use this very soft, lamb's wool, fluffy mallet, which over time will compress down. I use this quite often as well. Today, I'll just be using one of these DW beaters that's double-sided. Now, as far as uh, the action of the pedal goes, I like to keep it extremely loose. So if I hit the pedal like this, it stays in motion. So it's going to follow my foot rather than my foot following it. So it's, it's relatively loose compared to most pedals that I've seen my students play and other folks that I've talked to. So I like it as pretty much as loose as possible. And, and I don't want it making any noise. Sometimes if it's too loose, it'll make kind of a clicking noise. And I record a lot, so that would be a major problem. Now, I've never had problems with these pedals breaking. I've never broken one. Uh, I had some DWs that I've gone through over the years where the linkages will break over time. Uh, this one, not the case. And you'll see I keep the beater. This has no counterweight, by the way, as you can see. But I keep it pretty low. And as you see on my bass drum foot, pedal, the one I'm using right now. I'm keeping that beater about two inches, maybe two and a half inches, above the middle of that bass drum head. That's normally what I do. I don't necessarily hit the bass drum head right in the center. Now sometimes if I'm going for a really punchy sound, I'm playing rock, I might do that. But normally for an 18 inch bass drum, this is a jazz drum, I'll keep it a little higher than the middle because I want as much tone as possible. And just like a timpani head, uh, when you hit a timpani head in the middle, that's the deadest part of it. The same goes with the bass drum head or any drum head. It has the most impact, but it's also the deadest part. And for a jazz drum kit, you want that bass drum to ring as much as possible and have a nice tone. Now, as far as bass drum technique goes, I spent a lot of years developing the technique that I use. Other drummers use a similar technique. I started out by playing flat-footed, so. And I did that probably for the first two or three years uh, when I started playing drum set, because that's what uh, some of my teachers had said to do. But then when I started playing a lot of rock, I would, we'd play, I was in a Led Zeppelin cover band, when I was around 12 years old. And we played, you know, Good Times, Bad Times, and, and, you know, Moby Dick, and all those tunes with really fast bass drum things happening. I couldn't play it flat-footed. So then I switched and I brought my foot up. At that point, I was playing into the head like this. Once again, because I just didn't know any better. That would be like playing the drums like this. which unless you're looking for a special effect, you wouldn't normally do that. As time went by, I got a little older and more experienced and did some recording sessions, probably when I was about 13 or 14, I would hear that bass drum mush into the head and I didn't like it. I didn't like the sound of it. You'd hear that extra sound. Now this is before I was playing much jazz. I was playing a little bit. I was starting out. So again, no one would ever talk about it back then. I, I never 
read any articles. I had just started reading Modern Drummer. It had just kind of begun back then. And, you know, no one was talking about that kind of thing too much. So as I developed and got better as a player, I decided I didn't want to leave that bass drum beater in the head anymore because I would have to pull it out to play something else. I remember playing that Led Zeppelin song, the Immigrant Song. And you know, the band I was playing with, they were, most of these guys were all older. And I don't know if they were on something, but they'd always want to play it like this fast. And I, I couldn't do it with the technique that I was using, so I had to change something. The other tune they would do was this tune, Space Boogie, that Jeff Beck did, and it was with Simon Phillips. Now, I didn't know this, but he was using two bass drums. And I knew he was an incredible drummer, and he is an incredible drummer, but I, I thought he was using one bass drum. So I would learn that, and I played that like this. So to play all those things, I had to have a different technique to play in these bands and remain their drummer because I was the youngest one in the band by about 10 years. So what I did was I developed a technique where I would play side to side. And uh, I'll give you a close-up of that. Now, I didn't know this at the time, but lots of drummers do this. It's kind of a natural thing your body develops when it can't plenty faster. So I started doing that and practicing that. And the way I would practice it was I would do triplets like this. For hours. And then I would do shuffles. So I would do that over and over again until I felt comfortable. And at first it was a disaster. I can't remember that far back, but I remember being very frustrated. But over time, I developed that double stroke, um, double stroke with my bass drum. Now, mind you, this was all in a rock context, okay? I hadn't really played a lot of jazz. And today, obviously, I'm playing on this jazz kit, so we're going to get all into that in a minute. But for the rock thing, I finally had my foot technique. Probably when I was about 14, I started really, really getting strong. My foot was like, it felt great. And that was all because I lifted it up just a little. So if we take this pedal, and this is my foot, it was flat like this, and I just lifted it up that much, so probably just about an inch. In a way, it still looked flat if you would look at it. So when I do that, so it's not like the toe of my foot is like that. It's very relaxed. It's almost down. And I'm using not my thigh to play up and down, although it does move a little. It's mostly my ankle that's moving. Now, playing on a jazz bass drum is much more difficult in a lot of ways. And by jazz bass drum, I mean a small bass drum, an 18 that's not muffled. Um, from the inside and no hole in the head. So that drum is always moving. In a way, it's kind of fighting against you. When the head is dead, it's a little bit easier to play because it's just a, a non-moving object. But this head will actually push back as the air hits the back head and comes forward, especially on an 18 by 14 inch bass drum. Now this bass drum today, I've muffled it just a little bit. You see this Gary Chafee muffler on here. And by the way, I found out these are no longer available. They were advertised on the internet, but they're gone. So if you could find a used one, buy it. They're great. Today I just muffled it down a little so you'd be able to hear the bass drum in a kind of rock context on a jazz kit. So um, 
let's let's try one thing and see if you can see this. I'm going to play a basic samba with the hi-hat, but don't look at that for now. Just look at my bass drum. And watch the way I'm moving my ankle back and forth. Now you'll notice when I hit that accent, that sort of pattern, all I have to do is get a little more velocity or height with my leg and my ankle and I just drop it and that creates that accent. Otherwise, I'm just kissing that head with the beater. I'm not coming off more than two or three inches from that bass drum. That's the key to playing fast. So if I'm playing rock and I'm doing stuff like this, The faster I play, the closer I get. The last thing you want to do, though, is move your thigh up and down and play into the head. That sounds bad. It's probably going to give you shin splints, which are painful. It's probably going to break some heads, and you won't be able to play fast at all. So that's one thing you got to do, and that comes naturally to us. When we walk, we plant our feet on the ground. We have to do this unnatural motion to actually play the instrument correctly. So it has to be learned. For most people, this does not come naturally. Well, it didn't for me, anyway. So once you start playing those two strokes, then you try to start accenting certain ones. So most people have two bass drum dynamics, loud and louder. The trick to being a great drummer is to be able to play the bass drum as soft as you possibly can. So pianissimo, two Ps, very soft, to triple, you know, fortissimo, three Fs. That's the key. Because when you play jazz, you have to do a thing called feathering, which is this. So the bass drum's always going, and all great jazz drummers do this, okay, that I've observed over when I was a young guy and I was learning from watching hundreds of great drummers, that they all played their bass drum when they played time, but they feathered it. So you might not even hear it, but you'd feel it. And it also helped them keep good time. You know, drummers like Mel Lewis did it. I saw them all the time playing like that, just feathering that bass drum. And, and some of the older swing drummers like Louis Belson or Buddy Rich would play it much louder like this. Because that was the swing style. But as it moved more into bebop, that heavy four on the floor disappeared and it became feathered or ghosted. Now to do that, you need to lift your heel up off the pedal just a little more, maybe an inch and a half now and get that beater really, really close to the head, so. And then you're moving your thigh. That's how you're doing it. So instead now of moving your ankle, you're moving your thigh, so. Now this is a really difficult thing to do, and you could use a fluffy beater like this, that'll help. But I like to practice it, for sure, with a hard beater, even a wood beater, because if you could do it with that, you could do it with anything. The trick is to feel it, but not hear it. And when it's gone, you miss it, because it's the low end of the kit, but you never really hear it. And you don't want to hear it, because the bass player, if you're playing at four, is walking. If you start playing loud bass drum, it's going to drive him or her crazy. So you don't want to do that. It has to be really, really soft. And if that bass drum is ringing, it's going to create this beautiful cushion under your playing.
I like to actually think like a string bass player when I'm playing bass drum like this, just you know, playing right off the string, you know, with high action. <laughs> so the whole idea is to get a beautiful ringing sound that's very full. So this is going to take some time. Now you have to have a lot of dynamic control, and when you want to drop bombs, in other words, play louder within that, all you have to do is lift your ankle a little higher and then release it like that. Now, a lot of times my students will ask me, how can you play so many notes in a row so fast? Uh, well, I don't think about that too much. Like, I don't really practice that. I once heard Peter Erskine at a clinic say, someone asked him that, you know, how do you play four notes in a row like that? And he said, go for five. Or when they s said, how do you go for two? He said, go for three. So I thought that was funny, but it was, it was not helpful. So the whole idea is to actually practice those strokes so they're moving like this. So you might do two straight strokes and move your ankle on the last one, like this. Now I definitely recommend practicing the bass drum with the rest of the kit and not necessarily too much by itself. Because if you do that and then you go play the rest of the kit, it's not going to function. So that's a little primer, kind of 101 course, on my bass drum technique. Now let's talk about hi-hat technique. So the whole idea of hi-hat technique for me is very similar to my bass drum technique. So I am lifting my heel up like this. So I'm relying on the weight of my leg now to do that. But it's not a forced action, it's just weight. So when I play... You'll see I'm almost keeping time with my heel. Okay? So. Now some people do a rocking motion, that's fine. Again, I don't play flat footed though. Now the reason I don't play flat footed on my hi-hat is so I can splash. If I'm flat footed, then I gotta come back up to splash. If I play like this, all I gotta do to splash is drop my foot. So you see how that splash works. If I do faster splashes, there my foot's just going into perpetual motion which is a good thing for coordination, if you can just set it and forget it. A lot of times I'll practice some things where I'll play in three with my hi-hat and maybe five with my bass drum, like this. number of things over that kind of ostinato. As long as that's going, the band, anybody you're playing with, the audience will feel that and then you can just play as out as you want on top of that. So it's a great thing to be able to do. Now we can also play shorter splashes and to do those I play a rhythm on my hi-hat like this. So it's one quick open and close, like that, with my ankle. 
Now you'll notice I am using my thigh to drop my leg, obviously. I'm dropping my whole leg on the pedal. So if I play two and four, it would sound like this. So again, another great timekeeping device. And I actually saw Al Foster do this with Joe Henderson uh, years and years ago at the Village Vanguard. He would always play, or not always, but a lot of times when he was soloing, he'd play his hi-hat like that. So. You know, he's such a great drummer. Also saw him with Miles playing just really heavy. And then I'd go see him play this acoustic stuff. So great drummer, Al Foster. Another guy I saw do this while we're on the subject was a guy named Tommy Campbell. I was at a modern drummer festival in New York back probably in the late 70s. Could have been the early 80s. But I saw, um, I was on a program with Steve Gadd, Tommy Campbell, can't remember who else was on it, but I didn't know who he was at the time. I think he was playing with Kevin Eubanks. And wow, you know, he was doing all kinds of cool things with the hi-hat that I hadn't seen. So I saw that and I said, man, I got to learn how to do that. So I started working on that quite a bit. Now, when you do those short splashes uh, like this, you can apply that to any rhythm. So let's say we're playing a clave uh, with our left foot like this. So that's a sun clave. You can actually splash some of those notes. So. So you can come up with some pretty cool grooves doing that. Um. You know, use it for kinds of mambos, all kinds of things. And it's great because it gives you that splash sound, which is a little more, or a little different, let's say, a little more dominating than just the chick. All right, so I like to do that quite often. So ostinatos, uh, any kind of short splash sound is really good. And just remember, you just drop your leg and you put your lower part of your foot first, like that, and then you choke it, so. And it's a rhythm, again, like this. You could also do kind of a disco thing, which is That's a little different. That's opening it up in longer strokes, so. which is a rocking of your foot at that point. The other really cool thing you could do is play those kinds of open strokes and then play rhythms on top of it. So this is a little more complicated, but let's say I did a samba like this.
So what I'm doing there is I'm playing this with my bass drum, just a typical Gordon Variety sort of thing. And my foot's doing this rhythm. And then any rhythm you play over that's going to have all kinds of character because of the way that hi-hat opens. You're not intentionally saying, I'm going to open the hi-hat there. It's just part of the ostinato. So once again, if I do that, So those are two different rhythms, this and this. That gives it a whole new character if you can splash your hi-hat like that. So a lot of these, like I said earlier, are in my book, uh, Advanced Coordination for Drum Set and Hand Percussion. A lot of these ostinatos, my left foot ostinatos, right foot ostinatos, solo ostinatos, and I do have lots of videos on YouTube already dealing with that, but we haven't shown any close-ups and I haven't talked about the actual techniques I use. So if I was going to put it simply, both my feet are kind of dancing on the pedals. They're not playing flat, they're playing the same way, although there's no feedback from the hi-hat like there is on the bass drum. In other words, the hi-hat's not bouncy. It's kind of just dead. So you have to work a little harder with that left foot. So let's uh, play a little and then we'll call it a day. Hopefully you got something out of this. And we'll see you next time.